Hello everybody. Today's topic is social stratification and I want to give you a heads up that I do have two small dogs in the house who occasionally like to throw in their own comments. So let's begin. About 15% of the U.S. population has an income that's below the federal poverty threshold. In 2018, the limits for the 48 contiguous states as far as maximum income were $12,140 for a single person and $25,100 for a family of four. That means that to be considered living at or below the poverty level, the maximum income a household can have, household of one or a household of four, are those two limits. At that point, a household can still qualify for assistance programs, such as food assistance or, you know, in some cases, uh, cash assistance for families with dependent children. But if a household exceeds those income limits by even one penny, it can then become ineligible for some poverty relief programs. So we think when we look at poverty, <clears throat> there are actually different types for us to consider. Absolute poverty is when our resources are so low that it threatens our ability to survive. In this case, you might think of somebody who is homeless or uh, someone who perhaps does have, does have fairly stable housing but doesn't make enough money to keep the utilities running or to provide for a decent diet. Relative poverty, on the other hand, is a floating standard and it defines people who live at the bottom of a society whatever their lifestyles are. In this case, they're looking at being disadvantaged in comparison with the nation as a whole. An example of relative poverty. When my kids were young, we did not have a video game system in the house. You know, as a military family, we really couldn't afford one, and I didn't want one anyway. But other military families in our neighborhood did have one. As far as my kids were concerned, they were living in relative poverty because Everyone else had this luxury and they didn't. Social inequality, on the other hand, is a condition in which members of society have different amounts of wealth, prestige, or power. Those differences influence every aspect of our life, from birth until death and then beyond. For example, due to social inequality, people have different access to prenatal care even with state medical assistance such as Medicaid or Medi-Cal. Because of different, different access to income or if you live in a food desert, these places the, in some of the inner cities where you don't have ready access to a full supermarket or a regular grocery store and your choices for where to buy groceries are the neighborhood bodega which tends to have a, a very limited amount of fresh fruit and usually at an inflated price. Most of the other food tends to be highly processed. That's going to affect people's access to nutrition. Uh, housing, you know, housing varies, wild, varies quite widely. In fact, the military housing that I brought my firstborn baby home to would, had been built in the 1940s. And there were cracks in the walls that you could see daylight through. There was a crack in the kitchen floor in the slab that ants came pouring up out of. Uh, because it was built in the 40s, there was probably lead paint in the wall that had never been remediated. The solution was always to just put another coat of paint on the wall, which would peel off in really thick chips. And there have been inst instances, not in that housing, but elsewhere, particularly with uh, immigrants, who are coming in with limited resources and need to find low-cost housing. Sometimes the babies have gotten hold or the toddlers have gotten hold of these paint chips and have chewed on them or downright eaten them and they wind up with lead poisoning. One case that I'm thinking of, the child died because of the lead toxicity. So with housing, we're not just talking about how fancy is it or 
you know, whether or not it's infested with rodents and insects, but we're also talking about how safe it is, just the structure itself and what it contains. Where you live determines the quality of the education that you're going to receive. If you live in an area with a high income, then the schools that you attend, assuming you're, t you're attending public schools, those schools are more likely to have more advanced resources for the students to access, whereas a school in an impoverished area is going to have far more limited access. As you move up through, through life, the social, acts, the social networks that you can access, namely the people that you know as well as the people that your family knows and can introduce you to, tend to be limited to those who are experiencing the same types of life circumstances as your own, which is then going to affect what kind of employment options you have, whether or not you've got in, income saved for retirement, when the time comes, it can impact end-of-life care, as well as what type of a funeral you have, or if you have no funeral at all. My parents were always very frugal, and when my father was um, looking at the end of his life due to cancer, he used to say that you know, in order to, in order to keep the costs of a funeral, which can cost thousands of dollars. Um, but in order to get out of having to pay those, he had told my mother that if he passed away at home, that the family was to drag his body out into the front yard and then call the police and say that we had no idea who this drunk was that was walking across the front yard and suddenly died. So that you know, it would be the responsibility of the county to dispose of his remains. And for those of you who wonder, no, that's not what happened. But... It's, it's just an example that, you know, funeral, covering funeral costs can be absolutely unmanageable for families at some income levels. Social stratification itself is defined as how a society categorizes its people into rankings of socioeconomic tiers based on things like wealth, income, race, education, and power. The thing is, once these strata or these layers have been created, they tend to be self-perpetuating at all levels of society because, once again, we've got those resources that you have access to, you've got, you know, the our children start out life at the same social level that their parents do. It's automatically ascribed to them. So if your parents did well, then that placed you in a different socioeconomic class or a different, a different layer within the stratification system than a family that was struggling financially. The family that had access to more resources, such as money and social connections and so forth, is able to use those resources to benefit their children. But families that started out with less access to these resources you know, or with different access to more limited resources are going to pass that down to their children. This is what tends to keep these layers self-perpetuating. So people who start out at a high level socioeconomically are more likely to have kids who, re who um, uh, end up at the same level in their adulthood, whereas kids who came from families with fewer resources, more limited resources, are likely to end up at a similar level to what their parents achieved. When we look at social stratification, we're focusing on systemic inequalities, not personal failings. We're looking at systemic inequalities that are based on group membership. Group membership such as race and class, um, career path, level of education, things like that. It's the structure of a society that affects a person's social standing. So as I just mentioned, parents tend to pass on their social position to their kids. This includes their social standing as well as cultural norms and the network of friends and family members that can help kids launch in life. Our social standing becomes a comfort zone. It's a familiar lifestyle and it becomes part of our identity. Now, when we're talking about cultural norms, we're talking about things like 
do you enjoy going to the theater or would you, do you like going to live theater or just movies? If you were going to live theater, do you know what the standards or the expectations are for behavior when you get there? And how are those similar to or different from the standards of behavior, the norms that are expected in a movie theater? Um, what types of concerts do you like to go to? What kinds of stores do you shop in for clothing? What are your priorities when you go shopping for clothing? Is it going to be about low cost or, is it, or you know, do your cultural norms say spend more money to get a higher quality garment that's going to last longer? Okay, um, it's things like when you were taught, when you meet people, were you taught to make eye contact, shake hands, you know, stand up straight and greet people as Mr., Mrs., Ms., Sir, or Ma'am? Or were you taught to relax more and say, oh, hey, nice to meet you, and call people by their first names? Okay, these are examples of cultural norms that are going to vary according to the social positions in which our parents have raised us. Systems, remember I warned you about the dogs. Systems of stratification can be either open or closed. In an open system, our position is influenced by our achieved status. Remember that our achieved status is the one that we were able to work to earn, and so our achieved status is one that we can change. In an open system, movement, is, movement and interaction are allowed between layers and classes. In a closed system, on the other hand, there's very little possibility for social mobility. People are generally not allowed to shift levels. Where you start is where you stay. And in the more rigidly closed systems, they also don't permit social relationships between people of different levels. So I'm going to stop here for now and I will pick up in the next video with the four major systems of social stratification. See you soon!